Meat. It's what's for dinner. Kind of. Technically it is meat, but you could have people it's not what you're used to. So watch the video. <laughs> So I'm calling this meat 2.0. What do I mean by meat 2.0? I mean lab grown meat. We've got tens of millions of people crowded, just packed into cities who all want to eat meat. And if we want to supply them with meat and meet the demands of what these people would like to eat as far as meat, it really leaves us with a, an efficiency problem. So these mega cities, how do you feed all the people? Because they're not doing it themselves, right? The people that want to eat meat in these cities, they are not growing their own meat, raising the animals, butchering, slaughtering, grating, cutting, processing. They're not doing any of that stuff, but yet they still want to eat meat. They want to be able to go through a drive through get a burger and eat it. So that's the problem. How do you feed the millions and millions of people who are wanting to eat meat effectively, but yet are not raising the meat on their own? Factory farms is the way that we are currently doing it because it's the most efficient, even if it's not the most environmentally or ethically friendly. What are our options when it comes to meat consumption? We've got a couple options. So number one, don't eat meat. That's option number one, be a vegetarian or a vegan, right? Option number two, hunt your own meat. By hunting, you actually eliminate a lot of the ethical and environmental concerns because you are going out and getting your own meat for you and your family. Option number three, you could go and buy your meat from a local farm or a local source and skip out on all of the other steps that are associated with the processing of it and bringing it to a store. Option number four, you could buy it from a store, which is what most people do, especially people living in major cities, but it's the, the most removed way. The closer you get to the source of meat, the more ethically and environmentally friendly it tends to become. The further away you get from the source of the meat, typically the less environmentally friendly and the less ethical it becomes because you are disconnected from the process more and more. What I would like to present to you right now is a fifth option that could potentially be, and in my opinion, will be the way of the future for meat consumption, and that is lab-grown meat or cultured meat. Real briefly, and I don't wanna go into high level of technical detail on this, but I just wanna give you a general idea of how the process goes of how we do lab-grown meat. Keep in mind, a lot of this is still proprietary information. There are like 30 companies or so right now all competing to be the first ones to bring it to, 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 to market, basically. Molecular and cellular biologists are very good at culturing tissues. We've gotten very good at this, so there's no reason to say why we can't do it with meat. So the way it works, and this is what's so cool about it, is you don't actually have to kill an animal to do this. You take a biopsy or a sample of the animal's tissue. In this case, we're looking at the muscle, which is the part of the animal that we typically eat most. You take that biopsy, right, that you've just extracted from that animal, and you're going to basically put it into a petri dish or into some sort of environment in the lab where you expose it to different kinds of growth medium or other kinds of factors, growth factors, to stimulate the growth of the tissue. But the idea is you stimulate that biopsy, those muscle cells, to proliferate or grow and spread. As they grow, you have to scaffold them so that they grow into like a muscle shape because if you don't scaffold the growth correctly, it just becomes a, a mushy blob of tissue and no one really wants to eat a mushy blob of cells. So it's very important to get the shape and consistency right, which is probably the hardest part. It's easy to grow the cells and have them divide, but it's very difficult to get them to grow and proliferate into the structure of a muscle that we're used to seeing when we eat meat. But essentially over time, you, you will scaffold the meat and it will turn into a larger piece of meat that you can then add coloring, flavoring, you can add in some um, other nutrients to that to make it into a meat product that you would want to sell on a commercial market of some kind. You take that piece of meat and then you do what you will to it. You can grind it up and make meatballs or ground beef. You could actually try and make into little sausages. You could do it however you want and that's kind of up to the company's decision for how they're gonna go about that. But I, the basic idea is once you have enough of it grown, you can then take it and make it into a product that people could consume. Now, the one caveat with this the process is that it is currently, right now, it creates just muscle, pure muscle. And typically when we eat meat, there's fat associated with it because the animal stores fat in their muscles. So we have to, at this point, go in and add in the fat and the other flavorings to make it taste more similar to the kinds of meat that we're used to consuming naturally. And currently, 
you're gonna get some meat that you have to grind up and make into meatballs or sausages. It's not like it's gonna come out as a nice like rack of ribs. It's got, you know, meat, it's got bone, fat, cartilage. It's got a lot of other kinds of tissue and right now all we're growing is the muscle cells. Now in the future, could we get to a point where companies are able to grow a full rack of ribs with on the bone, with the cartilage and all that stuff? P possibly, but the first steps, the first things we're gonna see commercially available for meat, lab grown meat, is things that are like ground up to hide the consistency part of it that we can't quite get. So you're gonna see sausages, you're gonna see meatballs, those kinds of things, uh, pat burger patties. We're not gonna see racks of ribs, T-bone steaks, drumsticks, chicken wings. We're not gonna see those things yet because those are, are much more complex. So what I wanna do now is just quickly run through a timeline like I always do. I like running through timelines because it gives you a perspective of where things were, where things are now, so that you can kind of see how it's evolved and where it could potentially lead to in the future. You gotta go back to 1971 to get to the place where you first see the very beginnings of cultivation of muscle fibers in the lab. That's 1971. In between 1971 and all the way up to 2001, so 30 years, not much really happens as far as lab-grown meat goes. 2001 is when you actually get a patent being filed for lab uh, cultured meat. So you get actually a 30-year gap from when it was first cultivated in the lab to when a patent was filed to think about it in a commercial sense. In 2003, you get the first steak actually cooked and eaten. It turned out that this was a steak that was cultured from frog stem cells. Um, and it was really only a few centimeters wide. So it was a very tiny little steak that was cultured and eaten, but it was, it was technically the first lab-grown meat that was eaten. Then in 2005, we actually see a peer-reviewed journal article come out on lab-grown meat. That was the very first publication uh, in a peer-reviewed journal on lab-grown meat. If you want to read about that, check the link. 2008, what's is interesting here in 2008 is PETA which we all know PETA, sort of there's good and bad about PETA. In 2008, a challenge is dropped by PETA. They say, you know what? We're gonna give $1 million to the first company who can bring lab-grown chicken to the market. And they say, we're gonna give you four years. So if you can do it by 2012, you're gonna get the million dollars. Did anyone do it? Uh, no, no one did it because guess what? Four years is not enough time to make lab-grown meat commercially available. 2012, uh, we have 30 companies at this point working against uh, the clock trying to get lab-grown meat to uh, the public. So it kind of becomes a ramp up in competition again around 2012. The very first beef patty was cultured and it was actually eaten by French journalists on national TV and it got a lot of fame and a lot of publicity and it was called the $325,000 burger because it cost in research and development and production $325,000 for one patty. That was in 2013. In 2016, getting a little closer to present day, a company called Memphis Meats, they come out with a meatball and they showcase this beef meatball that is sort of now become a famous thing. This is interesting. In 2017, what we see is Tyson Foods. If you don't know who Tyson Foods is, they are like the biggest or second biggest meat producing company on the planet. But what's interesting in 2017 is that Tyson invest heavily into meat alternatives, including lab-grown meat and including Memphis meats. They start to realize, uh-oh, there is something here. We don't want to get put out of business in the long run by these companies making lab-grown meat. So what we're going to do, we're going to invest. We're going to play it safe. So to me, that tells me that, okay, if these big companies who are making many, many, many millions and billions of dollars off their meat products are thinking that lab-grown meat could be a potential viable option in the future, it tells me that that is something real to consider. In 2013, a lab-grown burger, $325,000. And nowadays, it's getting closer to like $12 for a patty. Still doesn't quite match up with a, with a, you know, a natural uh, burger, which is gonna be much lower, around three or three to five dollars a patty. But still, huge decrease in just five years, which tells me that if it takes five years to drop that much, what are we going to see the price be in the next five years? Um, and so we're getting closer and closer and closer to it being cost effective to come to market. Like I always like to do, let's list out the pros and the cons. Let's just start off with the, the pros of lab grown meat. And I think if you look at the pros, what I'm seeing is five major pros. And I think on the pro side, I think the first pro that we need to mention is the fact that it just requires less resources overall, especially less land and less water to raise these animals than to grow the, the, the meat in the lab. 
Now it could also potentially be less energy overall too, depending on how efficient we can get this process. But in general, it's less resource use. Number two, it produces less waste. It's a more efficient process. There's still gonna be waste associated with the process, but it should be less waste overall. My third pro, number three here, is that it is going to produce less greenhouse gas emissions uh, in a controlled environment like a lab than with these animals who have a lot of methane production, especially cattle. Now, of course, it's still going to produce greenhouse gas emissions because anything that requires energy right now, most of our energy comes from fossil fuels, which when they're burned to produce the energy, release CO2, which is a greenhouse gas. Number four, I think you can make the argument that this is a more ethical route to produce meat. You don't have to kill an animal, right? You don't have to actually raise it in unsafe or unfriendly environments like factory farms where the suffering of an animal could be at stake, no pun intended. Number five, I think that I just want to throw in here at the bottom as a potential pro in the case of lab-grown meat is that you could actually bolster the nutritional value of the meat by adding in certain kinds of nutrients. Because we are in a controlled lab setting, we can alter the meat to varying degrees. I think those are my five pros. Now, those are my pros. So on the other hand, we got our cons. I'm not including every single pro and con here. I'm just going to give the main. So I'm going to have five other cons. I think the first con that we just have to immediately talk about is the fact that it's super expensive, super pricey. So number one on my list of cons is just the expense that it requires. Number two is just the amount of R&D that it's going to take. It takes a lot of people working a lot of hours to figure this stuff out. The scientists and the entrepreneurs involved in these ventures are working a lot. They're working around the clock to try and get this stuff as effective as possible so that we can produce it on a mass scale in a commercial way. Number three on my list of cons for lab-grown meat is that there's going to be a, a lot of people, and maybe you're included in this, that just do not want to eat something that is not natural, right? This idea that it's been grown in a lab, it feels like Franken meat, right? It kind of has a weird feel like, do I want to eat something that's been grown in a lab? I don't know. I'm used to eating meat that comes from an animal. Do I want to eat something that's been in a Petri dish? People are going to be very wary of that. Another issue here, which is something called the Uncanny Valley. And if you haven't heard of the Uncanny Valley, you can kind of look it up. But the Uncanny Valley is, is a term that's typically ascribed to uh, computer graphics, or at least that's where I, I heard, first heard it, in which you there's a there's a gap between what you perceive in the computer graphics, right? It could be as realistic as possible, but there's something not quite right with it where your brain goes, yeah, that looks real, but it's not quite right. That is the uncanny valley. And in order for us to get over that, it ha our brain has to really believe that it's real. And I think if you think about lab-grown meat, with the issues that arise with the texture and the consistency of the meat, I think there might be an uncanny valley there as well. It has to taste right. There cannot be a gap between what it tastes like and what your brain is expecting it to taste like or the consistency that your brain is expecting. I think that's really, really important that the people working on this get that right. So one of the biggest challenges that these people are going to have to overcome is the uncanny valley of their meat. It's got to feel, look, smell, taste. Everything has to be spot on for my brain to go, ah, that is what I expected it to be and I can enjoy it. Now my fourth con I would say on this list is that we, again, this is new. We don't know the long-term health consequences. I don't know what they could be. I don't know any negative side effects of it, but I'm not somebody who's willing to shut the door to that because I do believe that when something is new, uh, it's better to play safer than sorry. And so in this case, we don't know what the unexpected health consequences could be of eating lab-grown meat. It's, a, it's, it's, it's completely uncharted territory, so who knows? But I do think we need to put it on there as a potential con because we just don't know, right? So let's throw that in there at number four as a potential con. My fifth con has to do with an economic kind of con, and that is that it's going to disrupt the agriculture industry massively if it becomes large enough scale. So right now you have a huge multi-billion dollar industry, maybe even trillion dollar industry around meat production. What happens to all those people, all those jobs, all those companies that work in producing meat? What if they go away? That's a huge disruption to a big sector of our economy. We've seen this already with other technologies coming around, right? One of the big things that people are worried about with self-driving cars is that it's going to eliminate the whole transportation jobs. So people who drive trucks across the country delivering things. If a car can drive by themselves, that person doesn't have a job anymore. If we can grow meat in the lab, the butcher, 
what's that guy's job now? This is, it goes away. The people that raise livestock goes away. There's a lot of issues there, and I think that that's an important thing to keep in mind at this number five here on my list of cons as an economic issue with the collapse of the agricultural sector in our economy if the lab-grown meat gets to a high enough profile and commercially available enough and effective enough and all that stuff. That's a big problem. With all that being said, where do I come down on the whole lab-grown meats kind of thing? In my opinion, I think it's almost assured that lab-grown meats is gonna be the way of meat production in the future. I just do not see the way we're currently doing meat as sustainable as our population grows, as more and more people move to cities and don't produce their own food. I see a big, big, big issue with our food production system as of now. So I do believe that lab-grown meats or cultured meats or meat 2.0, now I could be completely wrong, this is sort of a shot in the dark, but I really think if I look at it, I really buy into it. I do, I buy into it quite a bit. The reason why I buy into it so much is because it alleviates two huge issues. It alleviates one, all of the environmental pressures that are associated with meat production, all of the greenhouse gas emissions, the land utilization, the overgrazing, the waste production, the eutrophication of waterways. Secondly, is it reduces all those ethical and moral concerns that people have with producing meat that I share, I sympathize. I really, really do with those. I think slaughtering and butchering animals for me is, is rough. It's a rough thing. Now, is it possible that we could do it more humanely? Probably, but lab cultured meat is about as humane as you can get. It also eliminates all of the issues with factory farms. The animal suffering that's associated with these conditions in these factory farms are immediately once and for all eliminated. Two huge things, the environmental and the, and the ethical are poof, gone with a lab-grown meat production system. The upside is just too high for this to be uh, a non-factor into the future. Now, I will say that it's gonna disrupt the agriculture industry majorly. It's gonna be a massive disruption. Now, there will, there will still always be a niche market for people who want natural meat, right? There are just gonna be people who would prefer to eat their meat from a natural source and there's gonna be against lab-grown meat. But again, it's gonna disrupt the normal industry so much, there's gonna be some things that have to be worked out. It's gonna be weird. It's gonna get weird. Now, when is this gonna happen? I think it's still gonna be a niche thing for a while. I think maybe in the next 20, 30 years, you can expect to see some more progress. At least within 100 years, you're gonna have like lab grown meat's gonna be the norm. So with that being said, I'm gonna go have some steak from an actual cow and I'm gonna enjoy it. All right, guys, that's me, Mr. Jones on lab grown meat. I'll see you on the flip side. Peace.